Morning to you. The government has announced military tanker drivers will start delivering fuel to petrol stations across the UK from Monday. Visa restrictions are also being relaxed to allow up to 300 foreign tanker drivers to work in the UK on a temporary basis. In some parts of the country, drivers are still waiting hours for fuel more than a week after the delays first began. So from Monday, almost 200 soldiers will be delivering fuel after a week of training with haulage firms on how to fill up tankers and petrol pumps. Last night, the government announced it would grant visas to 300 foreign tanker drivers, allowing them to work in Britain until the end of March. But the Chancellor has warned that supply shortages are set to continue. He told the Daily Mail there is global disruption to supply chains in many major industries. Well, the Defence Secretary says the number of soldiers deployed as tanker drivers will increase. Yes, they'll go up beyond 200 over the next week. The, the first big amount will be really working through this weekend, deploying in Monday, probably on their own more. And then uh, by the end of the week, another uh, you know, 60, 70 will come online towards the end of the week. So you'll be over 200 by the end of the week at least. Well, the ongoing shortages are having a huge impact on people and businesses across the country. Dan Whitehead reports now on the problems being caused by the fuel crisis. Gearing up for a weekend of excursions. London and Torquay among day trip destinations for Applegate's coaches in Gloucestershire. They've just about got enough fuel, but the crisis means they're out of pocket. We quoted for work, you know, 12 months, six, six months ago, you know, even a week ago, at a fuel rate that we thought we were going to get, and it's gone up by about 20, 25 percent. So we're, we're running at a loss, really. It's more than a week since these supply problems started, and there are still issues. These were the queues in Stanmore in London just yesterday. The Petrol Retailers Association, which represents around 65% of UK forecourts, says more than a quarter of stations are still dry. It adds that 27% of forecourts only have one type of fuel in stock. And they say it's independent filling stations that are still not getting enough deliveries. As we go into the second weekend of this crisis, it is a real mixed picture. Yes, you can find fuel, but in many cases, it's not easy. And it's continuing to have a real impact on people's daily lives. If you find fuel without visiting six or seven garages, then you're very lucky. For contractor Lee Henderson, it could be a weekend of driving around the forecourts. It drives me totally nuts because you, 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 tr you try to plan your work. I've got to work tomorrow. There's probably 30 miles left in my tank. I live in Stroud. I've got to drive to Bristol. And obviously, I'm constantly driving all the time around Bristol trying to find work and do jobs. And it's a, it is a total nightmare. Any improvement in supply is slow. And fuel deliveries in some parts of the country are still sporadic. Well, it's peaks and troughs. One minute, one day you're, you're flat out and you'll be taking three times as much as you normally do. The next day you run out of fuel and you're sitting there looking silly at each other. And things like sandwiches and food, it just doesn't get sold because nobody comes in. Many, including the government, had hoped this issue would have eased on its own. It hasn't. And this weekend, there is still pressure on the pumps. Dan Whitehead, Sky News. In Gloucestershire. The Prime Minister says it's infuriating that allegations of violence against women and girls are not being taken seriously enough by police. Following the conviction of the former officer Wayne Cousins for the murder of Sarah Everard, it's been revealed 16 people are being investigated by the police watchdog as part of a misconduct investigation. Let's talk to Milena Veselinovic and uh, th this is strong language actually coming from, from the Prime Minister, a strong condemnation of the police. It's a very damning verdict on the work of the police by this country's top politician. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said that uh, the police were failing women and girls who were victims of violence. He said that while there were hundreds of thousands of, as he said, wonderful police officers up and down the country, that it's true that there is a problem with the way that the police treated victims of sexual violence who are women and girls. Now, speaking to the Times newspaper, the Prime Minister said... Um, 
Are the police taking these, this issue seriously enough? It's infuriating. I think the public feel that they aren't and they're not wrong. He also went on to say there is an issue about how we handle sexual violence, domestic violence, the sensitivity, the diligence, the time, the delay. So the Prime Minister laid part of the blame at the door of the criminal justice system as well, saying that once the police had done their work, it takes a very long time for these cases to go through the courts. It's a grueling process. And he said that something called he called victim attrition, women, women feeling tired and ground down by this process, in some cases uh, deciding not to pursue the cases any further. And he noted the falling number of successful convictions for rapes. He said the f system had to be fixed. But the Prime Minister did stand uh, and he boosted and backed the uh, Met Police uh, Commissioner Cresta Dick, even though there had been numerous calls for her to stand down. And he said the public should still trust the police officers. Uh, he said that an over overwhelming number of them were honest and doing a good job. Now, the, the police have a big job on their hands to regain the trust of the public, especially after some tone deaf, you can say, advice as to what women should do if they have concerns about a police officer who stopped them. Some of that advice said that they should flag down a bus or call 999 or shout to a passerby. And many MPs and just women in the public eye have said that the onus shouldn't be on women trying to find ways to keep themselves safe, but rather on the Met Police and other police forces investigating reports of misogyny among their own ranks. OK, Milena, thank you. Now, clinical trials suggest an experimental drug for severe COVID could cut the risk of hospitalisation or death by about half. It's a tablet. It's called Molnupiravir. It was given twice a day to patients recently diagnosed with the disease. The drug maker Merck said the results were so good that independent regulators asked to stop the trial early. Well, there were 35,577 new cases of COVID in the UK in the last 24 hours and a further 127 people have died. It takes a total number of people who've died within 28 days of a positive test to 136,789. 34,372 first doses of a vaccine were given yesterday. 34,459 second doses were given. 44.9 million people are now fully vaccinated. An auction will take place today to decide the new owners of the supermarket Morrisons. The takeover panel says private equity firms Fortress, along with Clayton, De Billiers and Rice, must submit their formal bids with the winner to be announced on Monday. Two new fissures have been reported in the volcano erupting in the Canaries. Scientists say they're sending more lava into the sea. Eight more earthquakes have also been reported on La Palma. And this is the scene at the moment. As you can see, it's still pretty active. Officials have described the volcano as much more aggressive. Now, the Queen will honour so-called local heroes when she opens the new session of the Scottish Parliament this morning. She'll use the occasion to thank people who volunteered in their communities during lockdown. Our Royal Correspondent, Rhiannon Mills, reports. <laughs> the Queen has probably lost track of exactly how many trees she's planted. This one on the Balmoral Estate, part of a push to get us all planting trees for her Platinum Jubilee next year. Good morning. A relaxed engagement to end her summer break in Scotland before more sensitive official duties. As against the backdrop of renewed calls for independence, she'll open the Scottish Parliament. Having captured that spirit, that ethos of the way people up here like things done, I think it's highly unlikely that the speech will be anything other than a continued commendation to the members of the Scottish Parliament that they're doing a good job, but they're obviously clear and major challenges ahead. Since the elections in May, the royals have made no secret of their love of Scotland. Visits to the Iron Brew Factory and the birthplace of poet Robert Burns, a tick list of appreciation for everything quintessentially Scottish. 
It's not unusual to see members of the royal family spending so much time here in Scotland during the summer, but there have been suggestions that all of those visits may have been part of an unspoken campaign to try and counter those calls for independence. In a way, the royal family again using that soft diplomacy uh, to try and shore up the union. At the opening of Parliament, there will be a more obvious focus, celebrating people like Dave Roper, who've gone above and beyond during COVID. He dressed as Spider-Man to cheer up local children and will now get to meet the Queen. I can't wait. It's literally, yeah, a life dream, definitely. I was working throughout, so it gave me a reason to get out each lunchtime, actually go and do something. Um, obviously, my wife and children were at home and they were really supportive of it. They absolutely loved me doing it. Um, and it was just it was nice just knowing the reaction of the children. Every day you went out, it just cheered so many people up. You stick all these doors in. Yeah. Unity and working together, all messages the Queen will no doubt support, but in carefully chosen words. The palace not wanting to again dig themselves into the debate about the future of her United Kingdom. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News in Edinburgh. Now, Conservatives are gathering in Manchester today ahead of the annual party conference. The government is under pressure over the supply crisis and rising energy prices. Let's talk to former Conservative MP Justine Greening. Good to see you this morning. I mean, look, the, 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 the country is in crisis this weekend. I mean, it's, it's not ideal for the start of a conference, is it? I think it is a difficult backdrop for Boris Johnson and the Conservatives. And there's no doubt that alongside setting out clear plans as to how he is going to make sure he tackles the HGV crisis. And as you say, some of those other economic headwinds that are coming down the track that are almost certainly going to mean that there are real cost of living pressures for families. At the same time, though, he needs to set out this much broader strategy around how we can move beyond the rhetoric of levelling up to making that a more realistic plan that means that people actually understand what he means, but how he's going to deliver equality of opportunity. And I think there's probably a third thing he needs to do, which is to make sure that he pulls a Conservative Party together. You have these new Red Wall Conservative MPs, but also some Shah Tories who I think are feeling a bit left out of the debate around levelling up. It's been very focused on the North. The reality is Leveling up needs to be a national mission for the Prime Minister and the government. And I think that's a key message that Boris Johnson needs to land this week. All right. Is anyone going to listen to him, though, in the sense that, you know, we've, we've had the situation with Afghanistan, which, which should have been foreseen. There was, there were, I mean, people knew what was happening in advance. We've had the situation with the general supply crisis with empty supermarket shelves, which people knew about or should have known about in advance. Same applies to the situation with the four courts at, at the moment, and yet the government seems to have been inactive on pretty much all counts. Well, I think you have seen a massive jolt to the economy because of COVID, but I agree that the big risk, I think, for the government is that patience starts to wear thin. I think people all understand that there have been some severe challenges that obviously post-Brexit, we're transitioning to a different version of the UK economy. We're not able to reach into that wider EU talent pool, as it were, for workers in the way that we did before. But I do think people now want to see very clear-cut plans on how we're going to fill and genuinely plug their skill shortages in the long term, but also in the short term. This all does tie back to the levelling up strategy the Prime Minister has talked about, he now needs to move beyond Rex, uh, be, move beyond the rhetoric and really set out some comprehensive plans on areas like education, on how business is going to be part of levelling up, on how mayors, crucially, need to get more power so that at a regional and local level, they can really develop more tailored levelling up strategies for very different parts of the country that all need to have a collective push on driving equality of opportunity. It's difficult, isn't it, in this? I mean, obviously, the, the, the pandemic has thrown a, a very large spanner in the works, but a lot of people say, you know, we, we, we get the words, we, we, we get the rhetoric from, from the Prime Minister and, and the, the top ministers of state, but we don't actually see any action. And it's why Boris Johnson needs to take the levelling up 
rhetoric and really make that come alive for the public so they understand what he means by that. From my perspective, we're doing huge amounts of work with businesses through the Social Mobility Pledge. We've broken levelling up down into 14 levelling up goals. Some of them are education, some of them are what employers need to do to help people connect up to opportunity more easily. Some of them are around other areas that help or hinder us, like the digital divide. Boris Johnson now needs to take a national architecture like the levelling up goals and then work with mayors and with county councils, for example, to work out how in very different places with different challenges on levelling up, he can nevertheless make progress. And I think this is what people now want to see. Everyone understands, I think, that COVID has clearly been a huge challenge for not just the UK, but the world. But we're coming out of the COVID challenge now, hopefully. And it's not just about getting Britain back on track. It's about fundamentally returning to those challenges that were there before, which is that where you start in this country, your circumstances far too much determine your future. That is not just bad for people. That is fundamentally bad for our country more widely because it means we're not making the best use of our talent. And we do have some big bills to pay after COVID and we're going to have a very tough comprehensive spending review. But the long term solution to those difficulties that Britain now faces is to have a smarter economy where more people are able to play a bigger role. And that's why levelling up isn't just a good thing to do for individuals and a fair thing to do. It's actually a much smarter way of running our economy because it's how we can step up one, two, three gears to be a higher skill, higher productivity, higher wage economy. Justine Greening, good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have a look at the weather for you and it's going to be unsettled this weekend. There's low pressure crossing the UK bringing heavy downpours and awesome gales. Uh, after a pretty windy night, you may have noticed, there's going to be more blustery showers in the north and west this morning. Elsewhere, largely dry, but there will be heavy rain in the southwest of England in the next hour or two. The heavy rain will spread northeastwards across England and Wales into southern Scotland. Much of Ireland, Northern Ireland, northwest Scotland will be showery with some sunny spells in between. It is going to be windy with ghost coastal gales in places. Now, during the afternoon, strong and gusty southerly winds affecting and heavy rain affecting southern and eastern parts of England before that transfers northwards into eastern Scotland. Now, there's a new and unusual exhibition launching today, if you like that sort of thing. Anish Kapoor's latest paintings are violent and gory. The 67-year-old says he's taking a risk. Uh, this report from our arts and entertainment uh, correspondent Katie Spencer contains some strong language. Disturbing canvases of bloodletting and guts. Anish Kapoor's latest work isn't for the faint-hearted. I don't see it as gory, weirdly. I think it's, it's, it's um, opening up what we all carry within us. Clearly, at one level, death is here. Um, but I hope so is beginning. Since winning the Turner Prize in 1991, he has become one of the most prominent contemporary British artists who made headlines with his polarising Olympic Park Commission. More often known for his sculptures, but Kapoor has always painted. And now at Modern Art Oxford, seeing the two presented alongside each other, the artist takes audiences to a very primal place, bloody and brutal, and almost like a human sacrifice. We must dare. And I think as artists, it is our job to dare. Um, and to, to risk it, it's a risk. You know, people may love it or hate it. What can I do? The wonderful thing about painting is that you just do it. So do it. It's all about doing it. And I paint with a stick rather than, than um, with a brush. An outspoken critic of the government and its decision to cut arts funding, right now the artist is angry. Educating our children to be fodder for the capitalist machine, how dare they? How, how outrageous. Um, it's a right-wing agenda that we have to resist with all our energy. Kapoor says the art world has to find a way to resist capitalism. Quoting Picasso, Anish says art is war. And is that what we've got here? Is I this hope war? so. I hope so. I hope it's war. Yes. <laughs> so, not nice little things that you uh, 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 
feel comfortable with. I hope bloody uncomfortable things. Confrontational work from Anish Kapoor, coming at a time when he sees the art world as under attack. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Let's have a look at the weather for you today. Uh, it's going to be... Sorry. So dis distracted by that artwork. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be very unsettled this weekend. There's low pressure crossing the UK, bringing heavy downpours and some gales, autumn gales. It's been a windy night, uh, you may have noticed. A few further blustery showers in the north and west this morning. Elsewhere, it is largely dry, but heavy rain is moving into southwest England. Uh, over the next few hours. That's going to spread northeastwards across England, Wales, southern Scotland today. Much of Ireland, Northern Ireland, and Northwest Scotland is going to be showery as well. Uh, perhaps some sunny spells in between, but look at that, it's not a positive picture. Uh, for the afternoon, then, strong and gusty southerly winds and heavy rain affecting southern and eastern parts of England before that transfers northwards into eastern Scotland. That heavy rain and the strong winds affecting eastern and, and later northern Scotland overnight. Elsewhere, there'll be a mix of clear spells and showers, mainly in the west. So the government has announced military tanker drivers will start delivering fuel across the UK. The worst hit spots, we should say, from Monday. Visa restrictions are also being further relaxed to immediately allow up to 300 foreign tanker drivers to work in the UK up until March of next year. Let's talk to the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, who's in central London for us this morning. Before heading up to the conference, no doubt, Health Secretary. Um, is this situation under control? I think you're referring to the fuel situation, and it's, it's stabilising. Look, there's enough fuel in the country. There always has been... What we've seen in the last uh, few days is uh, trouble in terms of getting that fuel to the petrol forecourts. I think in most parts of the country it is certainly uh, seeing signs of stabilisation. But I think it's also right as a precaution that the, the government has uh, asked the military to help. Uh, I think that starts from Monday. Uh, I think that's the right measure to take to, to make sure people have all the confidence that they need. But as a precaution, I mean, have you tried to get petrol um, any time over the last week? Well, I personally haven't tried, but my wife and my uh, members of my family have. And, and, of course, depending on where you live, it hasn't been easy. There have, there have been queues. I've also heard, again, whether it's from family and friends and, and others, that the situation is stabilising in, in most parts of the country. And the measures that have already been taken in terms of relaxing some of the rules around HEV drivers uh, and, and relaxing the competition rules so there can be better coordination between the fuel companies, I think these are all helping. Uh, but it is absolutely right, I think, that the government thinks about what more can be done because, you know, people want the situation to go completely back to normal as soon as possible. It's heading in the right direction. But uh, if the military can help, then we should certainly take up that offer of help. Yeah, but the, the problem is what, what the, the government never seems to accept <laughs> over the last week is that this is absolutely chaotic. You can drive round and, and never see a petrol station that's open. No, I, I've, I think government ministers of the last few days have accepted the situation uh, as it is, but what they have done is uh, responded to that in every way that we possibly can. And, and it's also uh, important, I think, for people to know uh, that there's never been an actual shortage of fuel in the country. There is enough fuel for everyone. And uh, I can understand why people, so perhaps seeing the scenes on, on whether it's through media or, or, or social media and, and, and reacting it's in the way that they have, I think that's uh, been a perfectly normal reaction, uh, but I think it's worth reassuring people uh, that there is enough fuel uh, in this country. Uh, the situation with drivers is improving, and now if the military are needed to help, they will be ready to do so from Monday. Yeah, I mean, it's again saying the military is there as a precaution. I mean, you've got soldiers on UKSB given 30 minutes notice to move at the moment to head from their barracks to to start on this job. I mean, that's an urgent situation. Any soldier will tell you that. Well, my understanding is that the, the military uh, won't be directly involved until Monday. And the reason for that is to give some time for, for some of the extra training that's going to be required. It also gives time to coordinate uh, with the fuel companies and with others. And I think that makes sense. But I think it's also uh, really important that we can actually uh, call in the military at a time uh, like this for that extra support to give that confidence and, and have this uh, so as a measure uh, that's there as a precaution. Because... 
as I say, the situation is stabilizing. Uh, no one's going to pretend it's completely uh, back to normal. I wish it was, but it's, 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 it's getting that way. Uh, but I think having the military available in this way is, is a really sensible uh, thing to, to think about. What about these, these foreign drivers being brought in? I mean, obviously, the move to get several thousand in, 5,000, I think it was, I mean, hasn't seemed to have gone down very well with drivers on, on the continent. Why is this move, do you think, to get 300 people, temporary visas, emergency visas, immediately, why is that going to make a difference? Of course, we've got a. Everyone knows. I mean, this is about a shortage in HGV drivers in particular. I think there's a shortage of around 70,000 drivers in total in the UK. By the way, in in Europe, in mainland Europe, there's a shortage of some 400,000. So this is a an international problem, not just something uh, in the UK. And uh, it, it's right that we try to find ways to get more drivers. And if that forgive means me, if temporarily... it, forgive, if, forgive me for jumping in, but if there's four, if there's a if it's a a continent-wide shortage, why? On earth do you think we're going to be able to tempt them over to this country when we've obviously kicked a lot of them out? Of, of course there's uh, competition uh, for drivers and that's taking place uh, throughout uh, Europe uh, but it is important that we try uh, to do what we can and I am confident actually that with the with the temporary visa changes that have been announced that we will get uh, more drivers but that's not the long-term answer to this we obviously need more drivers trained uh, to do this and some of the measures that have been taken uh, in terms of how that training is done you know how quickly uh, those uh, the training process uh, can proceed I mean these all the right measures but in the short term I think it is right to, to try and see if we can get more drivers uh, and I think that will work. Yeah, well, why hasn't anything been done on this sooner? I mean we, we've known this was coming. There was a shortage of drivers pre-pandemic. Obviously the pandemic's made things worse. Some argue Brexit has made things worse. Um, what, what, uh, and we've had a shortage on supermarket shelves for some considerable time. So why wasn't action taken prior to this? Well, there, there has been uh, action that's been t taking place, uh, as I understand it, for, for months and indeed for well over a year. But the one thing you know, no government uh, controls is, is you know, how labour markets move exactly. We all know that this, for example, has been tied up uh, with the pandemic across the world. But if you look at the impact on Europe and the, and the lockdowns that were, that, that were had and the different types of uh, support for the labour markets from the different governments in Europe, it's, it's had an impact that isn't entirely always uh, predictable but you know as we've uh, as this problem has uh, got worse in the last uh, few weeks and the government has responded in the way it has with some of the measures that we've just talked about I'm confident that there will make a difference and you started off again asking about the military and I think it's right in a situation like this uh, that we can call on the military for this type of support and as I say that will be ready uh, from Monday and uh, I think that will further help to stabilize the situation and give more confidence and that's the important thing. Uh, can I ask you about uh, women and girls and their safety in the UK? The Prime Minister has said he's, uh, he finds it infuriating the, the, the police's failure to tackle violence against women. Is this a police issue? I mean, it, it, is there a fundamental problem with how police deal with this? I mean, you were Home Secretary, you've dealt with the police, uh, uh, you know, in great detail. Yeah, I think um, that we all, the police are there to protect us. And, and what I saw as Home Secretary, day in, day out, uh, the police were doing an amazing you know, job looking after the British people, protecting people. I, I saw things that they did, you know, quite heroic things that has, has saved lives, you know, countless number of lives uh, you know, across the UK. But it's because of that, because they're there to protect us, that this crime, this appalling crime, has, has had the shock uh, that it has you know, across the country and rightly so uh, because we, we no one would have uh, thought that a police officer would be capable of this and and that is why I think it is right that there needs to be reform I couldn't tell you today exactly I wish I could exactly what that reform should be I think this should be looked at properly and carefully and the police do need to be part of that reform yeah, I, mean, I mean in terms of that reform we're talking about a societal issue here aren't we one of the papers this morning talking about um, exposure, I mean, flashing, as, as we always used to call it, being endemic in this country now, and obviously that potentially being, you know, a, a precursor to, to other offences. 
I mean, what, what do we need to do in society to change the attitude of, of those people who are, who, who are putting women and girls at risk? Look, I don't, I don't think there's one single answer to that, but it's a, it, it is a very, very fair question, I, I think, for us to ask ourselves as a society. And you may know, you know, a few months back, before I came back into government, uh, I, I did a whole piece of work and research into, into child sexual abuse and exploitation, and that includes you know, children, obviously uh, boys and girls, uh, that were being uh, abused by, by adults. And there are many reasons for the increase uh, in that abuse, and one of those... Uh, that I identified, uh, and there is more action being taken on this, is, is the, the, the online nature of um, your sexual material, whether that's illegal pornography or even how boys uh, in particular can access legal pornography. Now, the government's online harms uh, the bill, the, the, the work that we're proposing there will make a difference, but, I mean, that's just one you know, thing that I think uh, that we need to take more action on. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You, are you of the view that, which we've heard in, in the past when it comes to these sensitive issues, I mean, a lot of people say we need to lock it away, we should be, we should be banning this pornography or banning all this sort of stuff and, and putting it in a box. Is, is that the right approach or do we actually need to open it up a bit more so we at least are having discussions, we're talking about feelings, we're talking about behaviours and intimate behaviours and what is right and wrong and acceptable? I think actually it's, it's, it's all of that. And, you know, obviously illegal pornography is already by definition banned, uh, but what is happening is uh, more work uh, to make sure that those, you know, those, those predators that try to access that kind of um, uh, online activity are, are prevented from doing so. Uh, there is an issue around legal pornography access by underage uh, people, and uh, the government's proposals in the online harms white paper to, to have some kind of age related access uh, to that, I think, is a step in the right direction. But look, there, are, there are so many things uh, here that, you know, many of them in train, I think the government has taken some uh, excellent action on this. For example, the strategy that was published uh, this summer on violence against women and girls, the straighter, safe, uh, safer streets uh, funding, to having more police officers on the street. I mean, all this is about uh, making feel, everyone feel safer. And I think, you know, after this terrible crime and, and how the whole nation, rightly so, has been impacted by it, we do need to think again and, and redouble our efforts. Where does it leave you as a... As a uh, you, you've got girls, I, I believe. Um, where does this leave you as a father? I mean, with the idea of... I mean, I don't, I don't know how old your children are, but, it, you know, even when they're, when they're teenagers or, or early 20s or whatever, I mean, where does that leave you in, in, in considering how safe they are, just going out, going to see friends, going to the pub? I mean, what, what, what concerns you as... I, I've got uh, as, a, as, a, as a human being uh, in this. No, I'm the, a proud father of uh, four children, and that uh, includes three girls, including two teenage uh, girls. And and uh, you know, I, I think as as any parent in the country, uh, that, uh, that over the last few days, especially uh, after this uh, verdict, I think we would have all thought about uh, our own families and what needs to be done. But I think I'm just with every other parent in the country, um, that, you know, thankful uh, for our police in the work that they do to keep us safe, including my daughters and everyone else. But all also um, asking about the, the reforms uh, the police can make and asking them to show uh, the leadership that is necessary to make those reforms. And, and I think they will be coming forward with reforms, but working with the government, uh, I think we can learn from this and make things better. Minister, it's good to talk to you. Thank you. Minister, it's good to talk to you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, let's have a quick whip through the papers with Badisha and Dawn Neeson. Morning, ladies. Look, uh, can we kick off Badisha with the mirror, please, looking at the fuel crisis? Yes, uh, after that excellent well grilling of Sandhya Javid, who is very defensive, we now have some scary headlines about Christmas being cancelled. The UK is over. Uh, this is about the fuel crisis. It's about what you've been talking about all morning, which is the army driving tankers of actual petrol towards service stations. It's the looming Tory party conference starts on Wednesday. It's also the looming possible COVID inquiry around Christmas and New Year. I don't think anyone would be surprised if that happened. And it's about all the pressure on the PM. So uh, not just the entire country, but the PM himself, Boris Johnson, has been caught short. There's a huge amount of 
questioning surrounding how we're going to get out of this. How did we get here? Exactly as you said, yes, it's COVID. Yes, it's Brexit. Yes, it's rising fuel prices. Yes, it is uh, the ending of furlough relief, the pressure on jobs, the way that so many of us have not made a big rush back to socialising or to the office or to central parts of town. So it is a kind of, uh, it's an annus horribilis, I think, for uh, Boris Johnson. And uh, I love that the Daily Mail is uh, Daily Mirror is leaning into that fully and just saying, you know what, let's just put our heads under the duvets and I'll see you again in springtime. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good plan to me. Uh, let's have a look <laughs> at the Times, Dawn. Um, concerns over what some universities are doing. Yeah, this is an interesting one. I, th I thought we'd change, change the pace a bit today with this one. Mm. Um, universities have accused of um, advising, uh, abusing power with some of the introduction modules that they're, they're, they're giving to children. The, 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 in particular, the Times have picked out St Andrews University, I think, which is one of the top three universities in the country. Um, and evidently children, youngsters, they're 18, obviously, and we've got record numbers of 18-year-olds going to university this year, Stephen, and some of them might even get to have face-to-face -face lectures. A lot of universities still charging the full amount and not doing that. Anyway, this story is about the introduction module for 18-year-olds going there, and they are handed a questionnaire that says, you have to acknowledge your personal guilt is a useful point in overcoming unconscious bias. And if they tick disagree with this, they found the module. And it's like, oh. of, where, where are we going with this? I mean, why are we piling, you know, unnecessary guilt on 18 year olds who have been, let's face it, through so much in the pandemic, 18 months of disrupted lessons and exams and everything. And now they're going to university, which should be the best years of their life. And we're piling guilt on them because they have unconscious bias. I mean, what 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 they're guilty about being maybe slightly well off and going to university? Their background, their skin colour. Can we just stop? Can universities just start teaching kids face to face, preferably? Uh, yeah, I think that's it's, it's a very that is a very odd approach, I have to say. Um, can we have a look at the Daily Mail, Badisha? Uh, GP appointments. Um, we may have to double up or even more. Oh, not just double up, times it by 12. If you ever had one of those anxiety dreams where you're talking about your shingles or your piles in front of an entire group of strangers and you're butt naked from the waist down, Can't say I guess have. what? It could, <laughs> it could be a reality because they're now broaching the possibility that instead of seeing your lovely GP one-on-one, -on -one, who you've known since he was seven years old and knows all your stuff, you can dial in for some group Zoom face chat, you and 11 other strangers with your GP talking about all your stuff and perhaps even having a you have no authority here, Jackie Weaver moment, if there's one particularly <laughs> bullish pile sufferer who wants to over talk on the Zoom. See, Dawn doesn't like it. I don't like it either. I, want to show, I wouldn't want to show a group of strangers my rash, Dawn. I don't know about you. I don't want to see your rash either, thank you very much. No. It's insane. <laughs> and how many people have we put off even more trying to access their GPs. Already we've got a huge problem with people simply not bothering anymore. I mean, this is absolutely insane. Just we, Can we just get GPs open seeing people? I mean, it's I'm, not... It's not doing, I, I'm, I'm sure this can't be a thing. It cannot be a thing. <laughs> um, Dawn, let's have a quick look at some cheap holidays, can we? Sounds good. Yeah, let's have some good news, Stephen, shall we? This is the front page of the Daily Express. Rock bottom. This is not referring to your rash, by the way. I Rock haven't actually got a rash. Up. Just let you know, I haven't got a rash. <laughs> Rock bottom prices spark holiday stampede. Um, obviously, the the test for double uh, um, for vaccines end on Monday, so there are lots of bargain holidays out there. This one mentioned is to Tenerife, where it's like two hundred and sixty quid a person. Um, but every, we're all booking to escape the British winter, going somewhere hot and sunny, and it's cheaper than it's ever been, evidently. So bye.